Well, church, it's a great privilege and honour for us to be hosting uh, John, John from Keldy, uh, today, um, preaching at both our services and then spending a bit of time uh, with myself uh, uh, this week as we uh, does, does a con- consult uh, with our church. John was, has been a pastor leading a very uh, influential church, C3 Hepburn Springs Church in uh, Perth, but in 2012 was called by the Lord uh, um, to set up grow, grow a Healthy Church and John has done hundreds of consults around the planet. Really has an international ministry except for COVID of late. Uh, but it's been, incredible, been an incredible journey for me to, to build a friendship and relationship with John and some of the decisions that we've made as a church leadership over the last couple of years have all been because of John's uh, consults and, and advice um, with the staffing choices and a whole range of different things. And um, so, John, yeah, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, came in. Uh, we're just so glad that the borders between Tassie and WA are open, brother, and uh, has enabled you to fly in. He had a bit of a problem with his uh, car hire in Hobart, got in very late, very, very late. Did you get What time did you get in the, to the last night? 11 o'clock. And so he's had a long day yesterday traveling from Perth, and uh, but he's here ready to preach and uh, with a great uh, message for us today. Are we ready to hear from John? Let's give John a real warm welcome. Devonport, welcome. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be uh, with you in a beautiful uh, heaven port, as one of my friends calls uh, Devonport. Great to be uh, with you. Beautiful part of the world here in Tassie. Good to be in a COVID free state like WA. And uh, because of COVID, we now have Perth Hobart direct flights. First time ever. So it was great to fly into, into Hobart. My first time ever in Hobart. And I was there for an hour getting a car. <laughs> Hopefully I'll see a bit more of it next Sunday. It's great, been great to um, really want to congratulate Pastor Blake and Ace, Allison and the elders and the staff and the congregation here for the work you've done on the Ferrari. My goodness, it is spectacular driving in. I know it's not finished. It's building sites still going on out there. To, but to walk into the foyer, to walk into the kids' area, I walked into the children's area and thought my grandsons would love to be in here. Uh, just magnificent what you've done, and the Datsun 180B is looking okay, but you can get it up to Ferrari level, I think, uh, raise a bit more money, but uh, congratulations. I do love seeing churches buy property, establish themselves with equity for themselves, but for, for, for future generations, and uh, decades ago, a congregation decided uh, to build on this property, and this property, I think, was donated by someone. Is that from memory? Very cheap, very very good gift. Um, I love it when churches then go, you know what, we need to renovate, we need to stay current. Um, and this is such a beautiful enterprise that you've done to advance the cause of Christ, uh, to advance the kingdom of God, to build the church. And it sends a message to the community that, hey, um, we love our city, we love our community, and we're presenting a building that will... Uh, reflect our love for the community. So well done, church. Congratulations. And uh, whenever you do the big rah-rah, you you wouldn't have done a big rah-rah opening yet, have you? You're going to wait for the Ferrari in here as well, or we'll see what happens. (laughs) But well done. It's um, it's brilliant. Um, I I mean that seriously. I've been a pastor for uh, next February. It'll be 40 years as a pastor. Uh, I know some of you are thinking, you look way too young. I started when I was 10, (laughs) <laughs> well, maybe a little bit older than 10. Uh, but uh, I just do love churches uh, moving into their future, doing things that are risky. Uh, just take a risk to do what you've done. So congratulations, well done, great acts of faith. Uh, one of the things my wife loves is jigsaws. She's a jigsaw fanatic. I find her regularly uh, on our dining room table, taking over the dining room table with a jigsaw board, um, I can see people looking at one another. Uh, this might be a familiar thing in some households. And she has this magnificent jigsaw board that she can lay a jigsaw on and close it up when the grandsons visit because they're not helpful uh, with the jigsaws. And uh, she just loves them, thousand-piece jigsaws, all sorts of different things. I, they do my head in. I, I can't even... I'm good with the borders. Anyone else like me? They're good with the borders, the rest of it, like, oh, dear me. But she loves doing it. I remember when our first grandson, Jack, was born, that Diane bought him a jigsaw. And it was one of those jigsaws with big pieces in it. And you'd tip it out of the box, and I'd sit down on the lounge floor with Jack, and 
we'd put it together and bits of the jigsaw and everything. And then Jack did something really interesting. He put the box lid upright on the lounge floor and he would look at the box lid and then look at the pieces and put it together. And I thought, he's watched his grandmother. Because that's what Diane does. It's what we all do, isn't it? When we got a jigsaw, we put the box lid up on the table or if we have our grandson on the floor, we put it on the floor. But he did it by himself, put it on the floor. And he used the box lid as the pattern to put together this puzzle to bring it together. Uh, today, I want to take you to some people that I call box lid believers. People that I want to put before you as we work out how to live the Christian life. How do we follow Jesus? How do we walk with the Lord in a way that honors him, in a way that builds the church, that advances the kingdom of God? I want to put these people up before you, that you might replicate their lives, that you and I might be inspired to live the lives that Jesus wants us to live. And I'm going to go into a passage of scripture that I'm sure doesn't get read very often in church But it's Romans chapter 16, and I'm going to read quite a lengthy passage of Scripture. Uh, Paul is sitting in the city of Corinth when he writes to the Roman church. He actually has a passion. He's just finished what the old maps in the back of paper Bibles used to call the missionary trips. He's finished his third trip. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He doesn't know he's going to end up in jail in Jerusalem, but he wants to go to Rome and then go ultimately to Spain. He writes about Spain in Romans 15. He says, I'm going to drop into Rome and encourage you and bless you and help you, but also I'm going to raise some support so you can send me on to Spain. He actually talks about this in Romans 15. They can help him in his ministry. But what he's done, he's actually sent a whole vanguard of his laborers, his co-workers, people who have been alongside him in the journey of church planting, of building the church. He's already sent them to Rome. So when he writes to the Roman church, he writes a whole bundle of greetings, a whole bundle of hellos to these people. Um, And in fact, in this list, there are 27 people that he names in just 16 verses. Quite remarkable. Uh, I'm not going to go through each one of the 27. Don't worry, we'll get you out of here by just after 10. But I want to take you into some of these people's lives. But I'm going to read the whole passage first and give you an idea of the people who labored with Paul, box-lid believers, um, all of them. And I want you to notice as I read, and I, I think you have the text also in your bulletin today. I think it's written out in there. If you want to follow along there, or if you just prefer to listen, feel free to do that. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Centria. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people, to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. I want you to notice how many times Paul mentions Jesus in this passage. They risk their lives for me, not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Ebenetus, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampelatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend, Stacies. Greet Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Greet those who belong to the household of Aristobulus. I do love that name, Aristobulus. Couldn't talk any of my children into calling one of their boys Aristobulus. Just rolls off the tongue, Aristobulus Finkeldi. <laughs> Sounds very salubrious, doesn't it? Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus who are in the Lord. Greet Tryphenia and Tryphosia, who's those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. Four women in this passage are mentioned as working hard for the Lord. No men are mentioned as working hard 
for the Lord, but we'll keep moving. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. Greet us in Critus, Philogon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermes, and the other brothers and sisters with me. Greet Philogius, Julia, Nerus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. 27 people listed out. But here's a fascinating thing, and the first person I actually want to hold up before you as a boxed believer is Paul. Paul is probably around the age of 50, which in our day is young. <laughs> it's young. Dominic's having a big birthday coming up. Uh, it's a young 50, but in the first century, uh, the average lifespan was 37. So you lived to 50, you were starting to get amongst those who were older. So he writes as an older man, a man who has been walking with Christ around about 20 years, approximately 20 years. The thing I love about this passage is that he mentions Jesus, either as Christ or as Lord or as Jesus, a dozen times through this passage. In 16 verses, Jesus gets mentioned a dozen times. That's no accident. Paul has this passion for Jesus still burning in his life. He's served the Lord. He's walked with the Lord. He's planted. I, I think I, I, would, I would estimate Paul has planted in those 20 years probably close to a 20, 20 churches, be involved in planting lots of churches throughout the Roman Empire. But here he is. He's been beaten. He's been imprisoned. He's had all sorts of dramas and traumas that he's been through. He's about to go through the big shipwreck. In Acts 27, hasn't been through it yet, doesn't know it's coming up, but he's been through all sorts of trials, all sorts of difficulties, yet here he is still writing passionately about Jesus. As I get older, when I, one day when I finally get old, what are you laughing for? When I get really old in our church, I've been in our church 47 years now, my wife has been there 50 years, just over 50 years. I want to still be in love with Jesus. I still want to be serving Jesus. I still want to be talking about Jesus. I still want my heart leaning towards the Lord. I love singing that song at communion. I go to so many different churches. I don't always know the songs, but I love that song at communion. I was able to lean into it because I know it well. And thinking, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for Jesus for giving me your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, that I belong to a community of faith. Thank you, Lord, that you're a good God. Thank you that you're my King, you're my Savior. And my heart just kind of welled up this morning just with thanksgiving to the Lord for who He is. And I want to keep that passion alive in my life. I don't want to be just someone who turns up to church because you kind of have to turn up to church. I want to be someone who has in here this deep love for Jesus. One of the ways that I, that I feed my love for Jesus is I have a time and a place to meet with him by myself. I have a time and place I meet with him with other people, with the church that we go to in Perth. We still go to the same church. In fact, my wife was born again in our church over 50 years ago. She still goes to that church. We go to that church together. I've been there, like I said, 47 years. I love going to my church. It's the church that I'm going to go to to the day I die, God willing. I love going to my church. I love being with other believers. It inspires my faith. It strengthens my faith. I feel better after going to church. I feel lifted up and strengthened. But I think that is an expression of what I do by myself because I have a time and a place with Jesus. If you came to my house, you're more than welcome to visit us in Perth. You can come to Perth. I think our government will let you in at the moment. <laughs> but check before you come. <laughs> if you came to my place, I'd take you to a chair that I sit in. I have a chair that I sit in. I get up in the morning. I love coffee. I get up in the morning. I make myself some coffee, some water, get it together. I head to my chair and I sit there. I, I've got a nice big fat paper Bible. It's got lots of space in it so I can write in it. I love, this actually is called a TYB. It's not the youth Bible. It's the trash your Bible version of the Bible. Anyone ever heard of the trash your Bible? It's fabulous. A big journal Bible. You can write in the pages. And the whole concept is ruin your Bible. Write in it. Highlight it. Let the pages end up all dog-eared. This is my second one, actually. 
I kind of use them different ones for different reasons at the moment, but I like to kind of wear a Bible out because I want someone to read this in a hundred years and know, hey, that bloke John, he really read his Bible. He trashed it. He worked it. And I'll sit there with my coffee. I have my first sip of coffee in the morning. And I get into my scriptures and I got my pen and I'll read. I was reading Psalm 23 this morning, reading a couple of Psalms this morning, waking myself up early in Tasmania, reading the Psalms and I have my coffee. I sat not in my chair at home, sat in my chair and where I'm staying, sat there and just sat with the Lord. I said, Lord, wake me up, please. I've got to preach soon. Thank you, Jesus, for getting me here safe. Thank you, Lord, for being with me. Thank you for being in a great church this week. I sit with the Lord, and, and some mornings I'll, I'll sit for five minutes. It's just a quick, hi, Lord, bit of scripture, write a couple of notes, bless my day. Thank you, Lord, let's get on with it. Other days it'll be 30 minutes. Some days don't do it at all. It's not like a seven-day-a-week have-to-do thing. I do it four, five, six days a week. But I have this rhythm, this routine, this time and place. What's your time? My wife loves to sit at breakfast. She has her breakfast. Her jigsaw board is pushed out of the way. She has her breakfast, her toast. She has a Bible, and she has a notebook. She has a huge notebook that she writes all sorts of things in. Sometimes she just copies the Scriptures from the Bible onto a notepad. I tell her, you don't need to do that. They've already done that for you. She says, no, I like to just write the Bible out. It helps me. That's her time at breakfast, cup of tea, toast, Bible, notebook. That's her place. What's your time? What's your place? You need a time. You need a place where it's just you and Jesus. You can meet him through his word. You can meet him through his presence. You can meet him and put a bit of worship song if you want. You can kind of learn guitar like Blake and you can play a bit of guitar if you want to do that as well. I've done that in previous years of my life. Just had a guitar and just worship the Lord. To spend time with the Lord. So vital to renew your time and your place with Jesus. First box of believer, Paul. When I get old one day, I want to be as passionate as Paul. I want to be able to talk about Jesus. I want to be connected with Jesus. My second box of believer is the first person mentioned in this passage and You'll notice through the passage, Paul says, greet, 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 verse after verse, from verse 2, right through to verse 16, right down to verse 16, greet one another. He's just kind of like saying, say hello to everybody. But he doesn't say that in verse 1. It's not greet. It says, I commend to you. It's not greet. It's not hello. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon, a leader of the church in Centria, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she's been the benefactor of many people, including me. Most scholars think who have studied the book of Romans that Phoebe was the woman who carried the epistle of the Romans <clears throat> to the Romans from Corinth to Rome, that Paul chose someone to read it out, because the carrier of the letter would read it out and generally would take questions about the letter. We also know that, that Phoebe is a wealthy person. We can tell this by verse 2. She has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Uh, Corinth was a city of about 90,000 people. 30,000 of that population were slaves. A third of the city was slaves. So if we were in the Corinthian church, about a third of the people would be slaves. They would sit in church with their slave owners. And a benefactor was a wealthy person who did all sorts of things as a patron for the city. They built things for the community. They would have statues in their honor. You can study Corinthian society. There's plenty you can read about it, Google it up, check it out. And it was built by people like Phoebe who were benefactors. 
Now, people who were wealthy were able to be benefactors. They would take of their substance and bless their community and help their community in different ways. In fact, benefactors who were kind would actually buy slaves in order to help the slave and to help themselves. So if I was a benefactor in Corinth, I'd go down to the slave market. I'd find, it's Paul, isn't it? We are chatting before the service. Paul's a musician up here, looking very cool, very nice, playing the guitar. I'd go down to the slave market. If Paul was there, I'd say, uh, Paul, I'm buying you. Are you married, Paul? Happily married. Awesome. That's even better. I'd buy Paul. Bring your wife. Do you have children? Stack load. <laughs> Bring your stack load of kids. And I would buy Paul and his entire family. You will come and live on my estate because I'm a wealthy person. I have an estate. I will give you some accommodation. I'll pay for you to go to the Conservatorium of Music here in Corinth. You will learn music and study music. I will pay all of your fees, all of your accommodation, all of your lodging. And whenever I need music, I, I haven't got an iPhone and just turn music on. I don't have Spotify. You're it. And you will build a band. And every time I have a party and any time I want music, night or day, you'll be on call for me. Deal? You don't get to say, I bought you. You're a slave. And that's what benefactors would do. Some people, some scholars think that Luke was a slave owned by Theophilus. Luke was a physician. People like Phoebe would buy someone, send them to study medicine in order to be a doctor to their family and also to the village around their family. They were a wealthy person. They were a big person, a generous person, a giving person. So when Paul says to Phoebe, Phoebe, I want you to leave your estate, your business, your wealth. I want you to leave the safety of your comfortable life. And I want you to take this letter. I've written the longest le letter I've ever written in my life. I've written it to the Roman church. It's a very important letter. John Finkelty will preach from this letter in 2,000 years' time in Devonport. I don't think he said that. I don't think they realized that. But take this letter, read it to the Romans and answer their questions about it. And Phoebe, faced with this choice, said, yes, I love this woman. I want to meet this woman in heaven because I see a big-hearted person. I see a generous person. I see a person who says, here's an opportunity for me to serve the Lord Yes, I'm putting my hand up to serve the Lord. I know it's going to cost me. I know it's going to be difficult. It's going to be an arduous journey getting to Rome. You don't just get on a plane and arrive there an hour later. You don't just get on a nice cruise ship and do a Mediterranean cruise from Corinth and the Greek islands around to Rome. This is going to be an arduous, difficult journey. But I am up for it, Paul. There's a bigness of heart in Phoebe. There's a, there's a heart of giving. There's a heart of generosity. How many of you ever visited Perth? Give me a wave. Oh, awesome. Brilliant. The rest of you are missing out. You must come. How many of you, when you went to Perth, your host or you by yourself went to King's Park? Isn't it glorious? It's beautiful. There's nothing like it in all of Australia where you can stand and look across the entire city. It's the largest big park in the center of a city in the world. It's 500 hectares. It's huge. It's natural bush, most of it. And the area they've developed where you can look across the city is just magnificent. Two men, Lord John Forrest and John Septimus Rowe, the first uh, surveyor general of our colony back in the 19th century, stood at King's Park, stood there and thought, you know, what could we do with this land? I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, Lord Forrest, we could both build mansions right here. Those of you who've been to Kings Park, I wouldn't mind a mansion right where the Moor Memorial is. What a view. Stunning, glorious view. What a place to live. And they probably looked at each other and thought, that's a very tempting idea to build mansions up here. We could build a couple extra for our kids. We could own this escarpment and look over the glorious Swan River and over the city. And they looked at each other and said, you know what? Why don't we be bigger than that? Why don't we set aside this land for all the community of Perth to enjoy? In fact, maybe for hundreds of years, generations will come to Kings Park and stand here and go, my, this is beautiful. Wow, look at this. I hope Lord John Forrest and John Septimus Rowe are in heaven. 
Because I want to meet those guys and give them a massive big hug and say, on behalf of the generations that followed you, thank you. You see, you're living, you're sitting in what generations have done before you here. Generations yet to come will sit in the Ferrari out there and the Ferrari that will be here. They'll sit here and they'll go, thank you. When you're long gone and no one remembers your name, as we all will decline into obscurity one day, no one will remember our name. Someone will sit in this building and go, Geez, someone did something back then that is brilliant. And I reckon in a quiet moment, I'll say, thank you for having a Phoebe spirit. Thank you for being bigger than yourself. Churches, churches get it advanced. Churches move forward by Phoebes. Many Phoebes in this church. There's been Phoebes in previous generations, but there's Phoebes here right now who are saying, hey, Pastor Blake and the elders and the staff, you want us to step up? We're stepping up. Here we are. We'll take the letter to Rome. We'll do what you've asked to do. We'll say yes. I want to put Phoebe up alongside Paul and say, keep being a yes church. Keep being a generous, big-hearted church. And I need to tell you, Pastor Blake didn't ask me to say that to raise the 60K. <laughs> Just in case you're thinking, oh, I'm being set up here. <laughs> Not at all. Third and last box of believer. And this is a couple, verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. I wish the Bible had more footnotes so Paul would actually tell us, how did they risk their lives for you, Paul? Was it in the stadium at Ephesus that Paul just a few months ago had come from? We read about in Acts, the riot in Acts where people were rioting because the idol economy the silver economy was going down the tubes because so many people were coming to Christ. People were giving up idolatry and their idols. And the silversmiths got together a riot because Paul had turned the city upside down. And they got in the stadium and they were yelling out things to their God. And Paul said, oh, there's a crowd. Let me go and preach to them. <laughs> Serious, what a maniac. Maybe it was then that people were, yeah, hey, Paul's outside. Let's go get him. Maybe they rescued Paul from that. I don't know. They risked their lives for me. The kingdom of God does not advance. The church does not get built unless people are willing to take a risk. Risk is a four-letter word for our Bible word, faith. To, to take steps out from where we've been. Steps that are risky. Steps that are challenging. As Pastor Blake mentioned, Di and I, in 2012, nearly 10 years ago now, stepped out of pastoring, pastored for 30 years in our church, and stepped out by faith into our own ministry, grow a healthy church. I said to Diane, when we stepped out, I said, if this lasts two years, then we're doing good and we'll keep going. If it doesn't, I've got to go and find another job. Maybe gardening. I don't want to be a gardener. And here we are 10 years later, Jesus has been unbelievably good to us. But it was a massive risk for us. And I thought, you know what? I don't just want to live a comfortable life. I've got to stay pastor. Great church, great team, great staff. We built a brand new building back 10, 12 years ago before that time. We were sitting pretty. Everything was going really nice, healthy, vibrant, strong. I was in a great stage of ministry and just knew in my heart I had to take a risk. I had to take a step out. Di and I started in youth ministry because someone took an unbelievably huge risk for us. Our pastor and founding pastor of our church had come to me and, and said, John, I want you to come on staff. The youth is booming and growing. I want you to come on staff as the youth pastor. And I said, Pastor Frank, I'd, I'd love to do that. I'm 
really keen to go into ministry to be a pastor myself. And he said, that's great. Let's do it. And he said, uh, we'd love to do it. We just haven't got any money. I said, okay, um, come back to me when you've got some money. No, he said, look, we'll wait until we see the provision of the Lord in this. I said, okay, no problem. Well, I, I wasn't happy. I, I really was keen. And months went by. And then Pastor Frank came to me and said, he said, it's been amazing. We've got a miracle from the Lord. I said, great. He, he said, we're going to put you on staff. We're going to start you next February. Someone has donated your entire year's salary for the first year. That's what I said. Wow, really? Get out. Who's done that? And he said, oh, no, it's anonymous. Uh, they won't let me tell you. I said, well, how can I thank them? He said, no, no, they, they want to remain anonymous. And I said, well, please thank them on my behalf. And, and I just, um, over about 10 years, I kept asking Pastor Frank, who, who was that person who donated that money? And I'd wait for him to be really tired and <laughs> sneak up on him. And who was that person anyway? And he said, no, 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 stop that. No. He told me after 10 years, I wore him down. He said, oh, it was Wes and Sue Prosser. I said, no way. Wes was the administrator of our church on staff. Four young children, had some farm inheritance money come, and he went to our pastor and, and said, don't pay me for a year. Use my salary, pay for John, and I'll believe with you that at the end of the year there'll be enough money to put me back on salary. Golly. I, I, Di and I both have this deep conviction that we cannot live a risk-free life. When you have that as your foundation, when someone, I eventually caught up with Wes to appreciate and thank him appropriately. When someone has risked so much with a young family, I don't think I could dare. To me, it would be offensive to live a risk-free life. What are you risking? Maybe there's some guys here. The Valley Man course, I love that course. Did it in our church some years ago. I love it. Some of you are sitting here going, that would be a bit risky going to that course. Absolutely. But it's a risk that will pay off. Like all risks, there's reward with a risk. Maybe the risk you need to take is relating to a relationship that's gone a bit wobbly. And you need to risk the humility of going and doing everything you can to repair that relationship. Maybe the risk is to serve the Lord at a heightened level that maybe you've backed off from serving the Lord and you've stepped back a bit and go, oh, it's all, it's all a bit too hard. I, I just need a bit more comfort and look after myself. What sort of risk is the Lord asking you to take? Why don't you close your eyes and we'll finish in prayer. I want you to consider this morning these three box lid believers, Paul, what's your time and place? I want you to consider doing a reset of your time and place. It may be from Ground zero, got nothing going on in the Bible and prayer, John. Do a reset. Start with five minutes a day. Pick a time, pick a place, build a habit, grow a walk. Maybe Phoebe's heart of generosity, of bigness, has spoken to you today that the Lord is saying, get bigger, be more generous in your words, be more generous with your time, be more generous with your resources. Or maybe it's risk. Maybe for the men it's, you know what, I'm going to risk it, I'm going to go to Valiant Man. It sounds intimidating, but I'm going to risk it. Maybe the risk is to reach out to someone estranged from you, knowing the risk is they may just rebut you and offend you again. Maybe the risk is to forgive someone, to release that offense you've got. What's the risk the Lord is saying? I want you to make a great decision today.
Are you resetting your time and place? Are you getting bigger on the inside, more generous? Are you stepping out in faith and a risk? Father, I'm asking right now, as people make really good decisions, that your grace would fill them, that your grace would strengthen them, that they will find a place to walk with you in that decision. We commit these decisions to you in Jesus' name. Amen.